Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Peter Case. He's going to share some personal stories about being around Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. I guess the first time I might have met Tom Petty would be at uh, the, some like rock bowling party or something like that. Uh, rock bowl, like some D, some DJ or promo guy or you know, one of those, like all these rockers would show up and everybody would show up like stoned out of their minds. So I met him at something like that. He came with his wife at the time and they were like bombed and we were too. And like, I can't even remember if we bowled or what. But then uh, the first time I saw Petty play was the day the Plimsoll, uh, the, the day the nerves arrived in uh, Los Angeles. We drove down from San Francisco on January 1, 1977. And the first day we went there, it was either, I don't remember the order of this, but one day we went there to the Whiskey A Go Go. That was like our pilgrim, our, the site of contact for us to get to LA. This band Van Halen is playing. And we go in there and there's like 50 people there. It's like the last show at the Whiskey on, you know, we, you know, some night. Van Halen's playing. It was January 1, I think. or It was either this one way or the other. And Van Halen, we're like, these guys stink, man. Like, like. <laughs> Bad. Like, they do the worst version of You Really Got Me I've Ever Heard in My Life. And the guy's, like, doing wanking on the guitar. Like, this is crap, you know? And then, so we left. Like, this stuff's not going anywhere. And then we come back the next day. You know, I kind of like those guys now, but at the time. But I just, like, what the fuck? And then uh, we go back the next day, and the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and then they're also playing about for about 50 or 60, you know, mostly girls that are, like, standing around in front of the stage. And it was really empty. And I'm like, well, these guys, this is better than Van Halen, you know, a lot better, you know. So we kind of got into that a little bit. And then uh, I knew Petty because I can't remember the order of things, but we played shows with him, you know, a number of shows. And so the Plimsolls did. He liked the Plimsolls a lot. We played at the Whiskey one night to shut down the Whiskey, and uh, Petty came. Somebody, you know, we set it up so that Petty would come, and, and it was the closing of the Whiskey, like, it opened up again later, but it was the actual real closing of the real whiskey. Like, the whole place went out, like, in a riot at the end of it. Like, people were carrying out booths and shit, you know. The, the original booths of, like, the Beatles and Jane Mansfield sat and all that kind of stuff. So, he came down, and uh, we played, uh, we rehearsed and hung out and played, and, and we played uh, She's About a Mover. And we played with the Plimsolls and Petty. It was just, like, the five of us. And Route 66. Maybe something else. I can't. I can't remember what else. And I remember Petty just came over and yelling in my ear, "You got a great band, man!" I think he was mad at his band all the time, and so <laughs> he he really liked the Plimsolls. I don't know why, but we you know we were a pretty rocking band, and he loved it. And so then we started playing festivals with him, and it was always nice to be around him. We played some huge festival up north, Mountaineer Festival or something. I forget what it was called. And we played a couple nights at the Universal Amphitheater opening up for him. And he was, so he was super friendly. I never really wrote with him or went to his house or anything like that, you know. But I just knew him from on stage and dressing rooms, you know. I knew, I knew Stan really good. And I hung out with Stan a lot. He was a super intense, really funny, but like super ego-driven guy. And then, uh, I mean, I, I Stan, but, you know, he's, he was a good guy, though. But, he, you know, he, he was really satirical. And I imagine that got on Tom's nerves after a while. And then Ben Mont was like the sweetest guy in the world. And we both, we, we knew this uh, girl uh, in common, you know, we had like a common friend. And she brought me over to Ben's house and I would sit and play piano with Ben. And so that was like a big moment where I watched a guy who could really play piano. You know, I mean, I've seen a lot of people who could really play piano, but he's one of them. And I sat with him and played. And so that was really interesting. That was like back in like 81 maybe or something like that. And then uh, Mike played on my album. When Howie first came to town, I'm walking down uh, Laurel Canyon Boulevard, like walking up, and this car, this guy pulls up in like in a '57 Chevy, just picks me up. It was high. he wasn't even in the band yet, you know. That's how I met Howie. He was like a super nice guy. He just hey man, you know, get a ride, man. You know, I guess he knew, you know recognized me or something. So that was cool. But uh, yeah, that's all. I don't know that much about. Patty personally I probably knew him less than anybody but I thought he was always a real positive guy to be around he had a great vibe and he was always like really he always kind of felt good after being around him like you know sort of like Prine in a way you know you felt like he uh honored other people so he wasn't he wasn't like a bitter cynical kind of guy that much in a way to me I didn't think I know some people might have thought he was 
but I didn't. I thought he was like a very positive, like really, you know, um, creative guy to recognize that in other people. You know, I, I liked him a lot. They were really good. But when it really started to seem good was on that Red album, the third record. That's when it all of a sudden just really, when they blew up and they blew out, you know. That's when we all took that, I mean, I took that record home and like listened to it a lot. You know, like that, you know, the first two records were good. But then when that record came out, you go, okay, this, these guys just hit a home run. This is like a, you know, like a real, like every cut on this record is a great cut. And so um, I'd already known quite a bit about him. I was friends with this guy, Gary Sparaza, that, that had interviewed Tom. And this was in 77. Gary was from Buffalo. He had a, record, a magazine called Shaken Street. And he was like one of the original, like one of those kids that like big star in 74 and all that kind of thing. And so I was, he was a soul music aficionado. And uh, also he had endless interviews, like some big long interview with Petty. And he would always, he sounds like he works at a gas station. He'd always say it's like crazy things like that. <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, we, but we liked him, you know. And I used to go over to, um, I liked Phil Seymour a lot. And like we used to go over to, um, for a while, me, Elkis and Frack and the guys I wrote A Million Miles Away with, we used to go down and write songs at Shelter. And we were trying to um, get covers, but from people at shelter. So we went in there and they would buy us, you know, they'd get us high and like, you know, buy us whatever we wanted. And then we'd sit in this back room where there was a piano and write songs, try to get lucky. And, you know, um, Phil loved the song I wrote called Now. And so um, I was trying to get Phil Seymour to join the Plimsolls. I really didn't want to be the singer for the Plimsolls. It would have been so much easier to not be. And, uh, he wanted to do it, but he wanted to call it Phil Seymour and the Plimsolls because he'd been in the Dwight Twilley band and nobody knew who, are you Dwight Twilley? No, you're Phil Seymour. Like, why are you in the Dwight Twilley band? You're the lead singer, you know? So he was sore from that and all that. So I was friendly with those people at Shelter and Petty had just been through there. So yeah, there was a whole vibe of all those kind of guys and they were inspiring, but they were inspiring to me more as like guys that were making records and were writing more than a live band yet at that point. Like, it wasn't all together, but I found it inspiring that, one, they had a record contract, two, that they were, like, writing the way they were, you know, especially Petty, but also Dwight. And and uh, I, like, listened to the magic with Petty playing bass on it. You know that track? Uh, it's on the second second Dwight Twilly band record. It's a great song called, not Listen to the Magic, it's called uh, Looking for the Magic. Oh, oh, I... I'm looking for the magic in your eyes or something like that. And, and Tom plays, ba Tom Petty plays bass on it. And it's just a great track. And I, I really admired those tracks. And uh, I was a fan of that kind of thing. And I admired the fact that they were in the studio. It seemed like another world than the one I was in, which was like, you know, funky. I'd been in the nerves, but like we just done, like we recorded in Chinatown, you know. Actually, the guy did a great work in Chinatown, Kelly Kwan, but should have done a whole album with him. But like, I looked up to these guys that had connections with all that stuff. And like, you wondered like, how do people, you know, do things like that? You know, that kind of shit, you know? So it was, uh, you know, how does, how does it even happen? You know, how did Tom Petty do that? You know, you know, but you know, he'd been at it for a long, long time, you know? So, I mean, I had too, but you know, he, he was more, I think, focused on success in the realm than I was. Like, I, I think he might've had a, um, stronger vision of himself earlier than I did, or maybe a different kind of vision than I had because uh, I had a certain kind of belief in myself, but it wasn't exactly just to be like a rocker and like to make it big as a rocker, you know? I, I was, I had like, I was kind of thinking about a lot of different things. And so, plus I was out of my mind. You know, I don't know how out of his mind he was, but I was like really fucking out of my mind when I got to California. I mean, you know, acid casually doesn't quite grab the whole sense of it, but, you know, it's somewhere in that ballpark, you know, of like uh, a lot of acid, a lot of abuse, a lot of like insane people, uh, you know, a lot of problems in Buffalo, dropped out after ninth grade, uh, you know, got in trouble, you know, fucked up, you know, and then living on the street. And like my best friends were like, you know, felons that were running from the law, you know, we were like, you know, <laughs> I'm serious. And then, you know, that's what we were doing out there. And and so, I mean, they weren't people that hurt anybody, but they were running from the feds and shit. And so, uh, you know, it was a lot of problems. And so, um, but, you know, um, it's in my book, actually, which sells for $100 a copy on Amazon. But what doesn't? Do you remember the last time you saw Petty? 
I just saw him in passing at at a um, JJ Cal gig at McCabe's. Him and uh, Campbell were there sitting in with. Uh, it was shortly, yeah. That would be the last time, you know. I, I, I talked to Mike. I don't remember talk. I don't remember actually really talking to Tom at that one. I, I just saw him, but I don't think he saw me. And like he was up playing with JJ Cal. JJ Cal came out to check me out one night down and uh, check out my show with my head. That little trio down. We we're down in San Diego, and he came to some horrible club we were playing down in San Diego to see me play with his trio. I had. And so we're in the middle of the set, and like I look, and uh, all of a sudden I thought, "Fuck, I'm having this is like an '89. I'm like having a heart attack. Holy shit, I'm having a fucking heart attack." And then, and I, you know, I can't breathe in my fucking chest. And I look over at the bass player, and he's like, "Oh, he's having a heart attack too." And then the drummer, he's like, everybody, like somebody had set off mace in the club. <laughs> so the whole club. We're like dying, man. And so like the whole club just like empties out on the street. And like we get, we finally come through the confusion and we see JJ Kell like out at the other end of the park and like get in his car and like. <laughs> <laughs> so I never met him, but, but those guys all played with him on that gig. But that, you know, it's as far as I remember, that would probably be the time. The last time I talked to him at all was we played some big gig with him back in the, the Plimsolls days. I think, I don't, I don't think I ever talked to him after the Plimsolls. I can't remember though. I don't think I did. He was very friendly when, when we were all doing the thing with the plimsolls and all that. But 